Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, automotive enthusiast friends from uh, literally around the globe this time. It's uh, it's that time again. Time for another Moondeza episode <laughs> of V8 Radio, Kevin. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Moondeza. That is an Arabic word foreshadowing, meaning awesome. Wow. Well, that is Moondeza then. Fantastic. And uh, any of our Saudi Arabian friends listening, if I butchered that, I profusely apologize. Yeah, you just offended the entire country. Yeah. All right. Well, having said that, I'm your host, Kevin Oste, uh, joined as always by our esteemed co host, Mr. Mike Hubal Clark, on another uh, episode of V8 Radio that is uh, just completely boom tezza. <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for those of you who uh, tune into this show every time it comes out, uh, you're well aware that uh, we like to start these off with an automotive trivia question before we get into our uh, our deep-seated topics and uh, stirring conversation about all things automotive. Uh, did you happen to whip up a trivia question this time, Mr. Mike? Uh, well, this time, yes, I happened to whip one up, Kevin, and... Uh... Let's. I'll. Uh, I'll unleash it. Whip it out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I wasn't going to say that, but okay. It'll be Montesa. <laughs> All right, Kev. All right, Kevin. Uh, General Motors has made some uh, some pretty powerful cars over the years, but Kevin, I ask you, what is the most powerful factory stock engine that General Motors has released to the general public? Uh, okay, great. Um, <laughs> well, the fact that you said engine uh, yes. le- leads me to believe it is still an internally combusted gasoline type engine and not yes, electric I'll give you that. motor. So not electric motor, internal uh, combustion engine good, good. with pistons and everything. Uh, so uh, would that would that be the uh, the current LT5? Uh, making somewhere in the range of uh, 730 in that range, somewhere around there. That's my guess. There, there could be something else out there, but uh, I'm battling a little bit of a cold, so that, that's what comes out. Okay. I don't. Well, you asked if it could be. Well, we will find out if it could be, <laughs> and if it is, at the end of the show. Hmm. Okay, well, that'd be a... So that's your final guess, the LT5 making about 730 horsepower. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm statistically challenged today, so uh, that's what I'm going to go for. Okay, cool. All right, I've got one for you. Uh, In 1973, 80% of all motorhomes produced in the United States shared one thing in common, and what was it? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that you suck that's what <laughs> oh man in 1973 yeah all all motor homes in america shared the same thing 85 80% 80 all right 85% shared the same thing i think it was 80 80% of all motor homes shared one right. thing in common what was it that that they were rear wheel drive. Um, that they were rear wheel drive. Because you did have that GM, that GMC motorhome that was based on a Tornado drivetrain that was front wheel drive. This is true. And maybe I'm, it's a stretch, but I'm guessing that that makes up the other remainder. You could could very well be true. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to say rear. I'm going to note this down. This is your final answer, right? Yeah, my final answer. All right. Okay. Duly noted. Nice, nice. All right. Well done. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have for today's show. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Kevin, you just got back from a really big trip in yeah. a really exciting uh, show. Why don't you tell us all about it? Well, th- that's the thing. I'm, I'm still backwards on my on my clock, I think. Right. I, I don't know if I'm, you know, if I'm jet lagged or just, you know, what the true definition of that is. But um, maybe just exhausted. Exhausted is, is another <laughs> possibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So Kelly and I just got back from. Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and the Global Auto Salon show, and um, it was really, really unbelievable. Uh, I will open with everything that they had told us about Saudi Arabia and and the Middle East in general was wrong. Really? Really. Uh, You and I had kind of, you know, discussed this show in advance, you know, in the past couple weeks and months. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, uh, some concerns, right? Because sure. I- I've never been there. You were there in the military uh, mm-hmm. a couple decades ago. And apparently things are changing so so rapidly in the region. Um, for one, uh, that uh, a lot of the customs are starting to open up a little bit. Uh, so, for example, you know, they gave women the right to drive. I guess it's been a, over a year now, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um but, you know, a lot of people have told us, you know, you got to be careful for, for safety concerns and uh, uh, that, you know, men can't look women in the eye when they when they talk to them and, and mm-hmm. don't expect, you know, Kelly to be shaking men's hands and doing business and whatnot. And, and all of that was out the window. Wow. Um, That's amazing. It, it, it really was. It was uh, it was almost just like being here except for the. The differences in the way the Saudi uh, culture carries themselves, and, and what I mean by that is, we didn't have any. I, th- I think there was over the course of the whole week, we were ten days we were there. Um, maybe six or seven of the older gentlemen uh, didn't shake her hand, but okay. every, everybody else did. Okay. And the population is insanely young. I mean, they are, somebody said the statistic was like 80% of the population is less than 35 years old. Uh, wow. And, and judging by what we saw, that, that seems to be true. Um, it was unusual to see, you know, some of the older gentlemen and, and very unusual to see the older women uh, walking around. Now, granted, this was a car mm-hmm. show, so it, it drew right. out, you know, possibly a younger crowd. But um, the the people were just so nice, and and never once did we have any feeling of uh, of um, being unsafe or or mm-hmm. being nervous or or anything like that. Um, now we also recognize that we kind of lived in a bubble uh, because we took a right. you know uh, a really nice flight over there, and we stayed in a five star hotel. And mm. it was also a very high-end automotive event, you know, with uh, mm. with exotic cars and Ferraris and Paganis and all that stuff. But uh, even so, there was the general public was there, and and we mm-hmm. we left the hotel and 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 ventured into Riyadh a little bit to uh, uh, to the embassy and also to an air force base and, and cool, met some yeah. people along the way. And the population was just so gracious. Um, over and over again, they thanked us for being there. They thanked us for having that event. They thanked us for having the interest in, in the region and helping them grow the automotive market, which was one of the main goals of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, we were really, really amazed at, um, at just how inaccurate the information was that we had gotten ahead of time about what to expect. Oh, boy. Well, yeah. I apologize for the part I played in that. Uh, I mean, obviously, I only had what my experience was 30 years ago um, when I was in Saudi Arabia. So Right, um, and, and that, I think it was good, you know, because uh, we it was always better to be cautious, Mm-hmm. You know, sure. than than to be lax, um, but I, I just think a lot of that stuff has just changed so much that uh, it doesn't really apply today. Uh, mm. And and the familiarity. So we were concerned about a language barrier. Everybody there spoke English. Um, there was uh, 
a few instances, like for example, um, at this show, there was many different components of entertainment. So they had, they had an auction, they had a, a salon where cars were for sale. They mm-hmm. had some attractions like the giant Hot Wheels loop. Uh, Speaking of the giant Hot Wheels loop, yeah, was that functional? Yes. Because I did not see one car go on it. I uh, saw no video of that. There is video out there, and, and I'll share is it. Is there? Um, okay. Yeah. And they didn't think the schedule was a little bit loose on this stuff. So I think they did it a couple of times a day at, at the height of the crowds. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I, in fact, I watched the video again today. Um, I, I think it's a British guy that, that does that. He's okay. Like, Kelly met the driver, and, uh, and that's a whole thing in itself, doing the, the, mm-hmm. the live Hot Wheels loop. But uh, there was a Formula One demonstration. It's a 500-meter track that they would buzz up and down and chase each other. There was a, a Monster Jam deal with you know monster trucks. There was drifting. There was a Hoonigan set up with even you know more drifting and smoke shows. So there was all these different types of entertainment outside. And then in the tents, which were you know building structures. Uh, they had a couple, I guess, 250 or so different vendors and manufacturers from the U.S. that came out. So you had like Aeromotive was there and, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, some of the wheel companies and, and Magnaflow and, you know, all, all the big brands that we know and love here. Right. Um, so the, the purpose of the show was not only to entertain people with all of the displays, but also to help establish a bigger footprint for uh, automotive enthusiasts and and products and and business to expand in that area, and we didn't know what these people were expecting from us, you know, because Aeromotive, you know, we know them as a company that makes you know high performance fuel systems for for drag cars and. And right. stuff here is that going to translate, you know, to over there? We, mm-hmm. we just didn't know. And it turns out that uh, the Saudi population uh, are a bunch of people that really dig cars and knew Aeromotive. And uh, in fact, there's a, a, a brand of Nissan truck called the Nissan Patrol, which is sold there and not here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, it's kind of like a Nissan Pathfinder. Um, okay. But those guys are modifying those things like crazy out there. They're putting LS motors in them with superchargers and turbos and stuff. Righteous. Yeah, and they needed fuel system upgrades. So Aeromotive mm-hmm. previously had a couple of dealers kind of set up, but they developed a product line for that truck. And when they went out uh, at this event that we were just at, um, they were taking orders like crazy to sell these things. Nice. So the, the market is there totally um it's not as sophisticated as here because they don't you don't have you know mass retailers like your summit racing and jags and stuff like that right technically you, you got to kind of buy stuff uh in containers and have it brought over um oh, which, I see. you know can be kind of challenging their distribution uh networks are are very different um so kind of cumbersome you know you, you it, it's mm-hmm. a person who owns a small shop who tries to make a deal with somebody else to bring this stuff in um, okay so so that was another aspect is trying to uh, build the sophistication into their distribution system yeah. um, for retail sales of parts and stuff um, so it, it was far more than a car show and and uh-huh. far more than the the hot wheels loop uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, uh, so my my function over there was um, I was hired by Bonnie Air, which put on a big part of the event uh, mm-hmm. to host some uh, roundtables uh, uh, on stage with mm-hmm. um, people from here from the U.S., but also individuals from from Saudi Arabia who are in the the car world over there and and have cross communication about what they need and and how things work and and to try and find ways to have American companies satisfy uh, the needs and open up that market Uh so we we learned a ton Um, in addition our friend uh, Solemn who owns the uh, the blue ZR9 Camaro that we built a few years ago 
Right. He brought that car in from Dubai and had it on display in our booth for our shop. How's it looking? It's looking awesome. Um, yeah. The car has been done for three years now, and it looks like the day we sent it. I mean, is that right? It, it looks perfect. Yeah. That's uh, sweet. And he's only, I think he's put 2,500 miles on it or something like that. He, he hasn't driven it a whole lot, but he's driven it. Mm-hmm. And he, he's Good. driven it hard. I mean, it's been over 167 miles an hour, so uh, that was cool to see that. Um, but the car was a, a traffic stopper. You know, people were coming by and, and just pointing at the car. And it's funny because a lot of them knew what it was. Um, a lot cool. of them, a lot of people just think, a muscle car is a is a Mustang <laughs> or a, a Camaro. Mm-hmm. You know they, they don't really know <laughs> you know what it was, but right. we also had uh, a strong response of people that wanted to potentially hire us to build one for them. So that was pretty cool too. So uh, going into this thing with kind of wide open expectations uh, was great because by the end of the trip. Um, I came home realizing how little I know about the world. <laughs> That's what it all boils down to. <laughs> I believe it. I mean, it really sounds like it's becoming the birth of a of a whole new automotive movement out there, and they they the desire was there, but now they're they're going to be able to figure out the infrastructure and how to get those uh, those mega box stores like a Summit or a Jegs to maybe expand out there and really feed this to where it really, you know, from its infancy to really being something that's really prime time out there. Well, I guess that would be the ultimate goal. Um, Yeah. They they have a long way to go because uh, there's cultural differences that that are challenging. They don't really have much in the way of tech schools and trade schools. Mm. So, So much of their information comes from watching YouTube videos of, of how mm-hmm. to do modifications to the cars. And you know as well as I that that information's there, but is it is it accurate, you know? Yeah, I um, mean, maybe, maybe half the time, yeah, if you're maybe. lucky. Right, it's entertaining, but there's no standards there. So that's a challenge. Um, the other things that we've learned is that they're, they've got a lot of regulations that they're fighting the same way we are here. Um, mm-hmm. But theirs are kind of different. For example, you, you can't change the color of a car in Saudi. Uh, because it's, Really? Yeah, it's an identifier for that vehicle. They, they look at it as almost an extension of the VIN. So it's illegal to paint a car a different color. Wow. Yeah. I did not know this. Yeah, no, nobody did, you know, until we got there. Yeah. Um, and even if you put stickers on a car, you can get in trouble. Um, so huh. they're they're fighting that um, right now. Technically, it is illegal to drive a classic car on the road. Um, is that so? Yeah. So if we had shipped over, and, and, and that's a whole other topic. I begin to start saying if we shipped over a car, the people in Saudi Arabia have, you know, old cars and classic cars were sold there new mm-hmm. in the sixties and fifties. Okay. You know? And they can't drive those legally on the road. Uh, really? Because of... I never really got to the bottom of why. I don't know if it's a safety thing or if it's a, a registration it's thing a, or whatnot. An end-of-life thing. They decide that it's no longer a viable uh, um, unit. Yeah, but what we did learn is that the fine isn't very high, so a lot of people drive them anyway, oh, and they just okay. say, we don't care. Right? It's kind of illegal, but it's not really enforced, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. Um, and we also learned that uh, many, 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 many people are educated uh, secondary education here in the U.S. So hmm. I can't tell you how many people we met that were Saudi nationals. They were born there, and uh, they went to UCLA, or they went to John Marshall, or they went to Harvard, or they went to any number of United States um, universities. And... That was pretty wild to uh, to share stories with these people uh, that were common, you know, U.S. stories, um, not expecting them to have that knowledge, you know, but but they were here for four years or for seven years or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
And for many of them, uh, the kingdom paid for them to come over and get that education uh, in hopes that they would take that knowledge back uh, to the kingdom and, and enhance their society. Uh-huh. Uh, but if, if they chose to stay here, um, it's not like they had to pay that money back. You know, they were, the kingdom was okay with them staying, um, I guess, assuming that eventually they'll come back. Okay. Uh, so we had met a guy, we went to a cars and coffee thing, and I, I shared that video on right online about the cars and coffee. And it was exactly like being at a cars and coffee in Southern California or, or, or anywhere. Uh, several hundred cars. Um, they ran everywhere from 60s muscle cars to late model Corvettes and, and you know, of course, European and Japanese and trucks and uh-huh. all kinds of stuff. Uh-huh. And this one dude in particular uh, rolled up in a 68 Buick LeSabre. Nice. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, cool, you know, an old Buick. So I, I walked over and I was talking to him, and he had bought that car in St. Louis, not far from, from our shop, uh, when he was going to school at St. Louis University. Huh. And he, he really liked it, so he shipped it back home for him. And... Uh, I was talking to him and I said, so what's under the hood? And, and it was originally a Buick 430 car mm-hmm. and he blew up the Buick motor and he couldn't get parts. So oh, man. now it had a small block Chevy under the hood that he had bought out of a truck and a junkyard and mm. installed it. Um, but I was, it was kind of a bummer because the whole engine was covered in oil and oh, no. it had open vacuum ports and... It was missing oh, wow. hardware out of the alternator bracket and everything, and and I said, okay, so, you know, what, what, what's going on here? I said, you know, how does this thing run? And he's like, oh, yeah, it runs, runs really good. And he starts yeah. it up, and it, it idles okay, uh, but his vacuum ports that were open were, were ported. So I, oh, s- I said, okay. you know, rev it up, and he goes to rev the thing up, and the throttle blades open, and it exposed these vacuum ports, and it stumbles, uh-huh. you know? And yeah. I said, okay, well, here, here's your problem. I said, do you see these these ports that are open? And the guy's like, oh, yeah. And I said, put your thumb over that. So he puts his thumb over it, and we rev it up again, and it runs a lot smoother. Mm-hmm. And I said, what you're doing is you're sucking air in without fuel through that port, and it's making it run lean and popping. Oh, so should I should I plug? I said, yeah, you should <laughs> you know, make a make a plug. And he's like, oh, thank you, thank you. You know, we, we just don't know. We need help. We need help. So huh. I said... Uh, let me take a few pictures of your engine and I will look at this thing on the plane going home and see if I can offer some suggestions on how to make this thing run better. I think he had a bad uh, PCV valve or something and it was spitting oil out over all over the place. And right. So he had all the desire but didn't have, you know, the knowledge to... None of the knowledge. You know, keep this thing going. That's It's funny you say that because um, I think this seems to still have held true back from when I was in Saudi Arabia and probably for years before then, uh, the Saudis don't, they don't really do anything themselves. They outsource almost all of their labor. So they just don't have that educational basis to, to know about these things. Right. And that, I mean, what you just said there just really rings true to that. Yeah. And that was an interesting thing to learn because the more longer there, the more we picked up on that very concept that uh, mm-hmm. uh, this this the Saudi culture. I mean, so everybody was super gracious. They were super nice, very mm-hmm. welcoming, uh, very warm, nice people. But uh, you're right. In the in the hotel, uh, in the morning, we would have a um, buffet style breakfast in the hotel. Mm-hmm. Not like any buffet I'd ever been to. I mean, they had different areas for different regions of the world. So they had like a uh, an Asian buffet, and then they had uh, American style food, and they had traditional Arabic, and then they had like mm. Brazilian, and you know anything you wanted was there. Right but, on. but we gathered that all the okay. staffers were Indonesian and Lebanese yeah. uh, laborers yeah. that came over, and uh, the people that were building the event, putting the tents up, and and doing the legwork were a lot a lot of people from North Africa and you know different. Sure. different countries we met some individuals there that that turned out to be uh some pretty good friends of ours um 
these people, uh, three gentlemen, are part of a, uh, a car club that kind of spans the whole region. And they uh, each one of them had their own museum, uh, ranging from 20 cars up to 80 cars. And wow. they cool. were displaying at this event because they are also very involved with trying to grow the industry and 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 build all this up so they they're heavily invested in in cars and in the culture and everything and it was funny the one guy went to school at ucla and and hung out in southern nice. california and has been to like socal speed shop and all that stuff you know dig it he was a hot rodder you know um but but talking with him and some of the and the other two guys the one guy again he had like 60 cars in his museum but the, the person who worked on the cars was a non-English speaking guy from Turkey. So he had this Turkish okay. mechanic that came down and spun the wrenches. So Nice. Yeah. And, huh. and, and that guy was super, super nice. Uh, during the event, he was pouring us tea the whole time and, and, and Saudi Arabian coffee and handing out cookies and stuff. And, Oh, cool. <laughs> Very nice. He didn't speak a word of English, and it was uh, a little bit tricky to communicate with him, except for uh, we had a phone app that we could type and translate. Okay, cool. And you could use, like, Google Translate or whatever. Right. Um, so our, our customer and friend, uh, Grady, uh, who you know, uh, yeah. he came with us, and, and Grady and, and the, the Turkish guy really bonded and they were is that right? passing love letters to each other, basically, about, you know, how much... I don't, I don't have a lot of trouble believing that. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. <laughs> well, the, the Turkish guy eventually typed out to Greedy that he loved him with all his heart. <laughs> 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 and he's being Grady's sincere. Greedy's got a nice you know? pen pal. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, so that was pretty wild, you know, to learn that, uh, like you're saying, they... And again, it's part of that that culture because they don't have the, the trade schools, and mm-hmm. um, so newer cars get serviced at, at dealers. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have a you know a supercar, if you if you're lucky enough to have a Ferrari or something, um, mm-hmm. you might ship that out of the country to have it worked on. Uh, My maybe goodness. to uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, mm-hmm. to Dubai, or or even back to Europe. Um, and, and we also learned that some of those people will buy a new one and they'll drive it basically until the first maintenance period comes up, you know, at two years mm-hmm. or a year or something, and, and maybe trade it for a new one, you know, and just avoid My goodness. that whole thing. So huh. that is something else. Yeah, yeah that really is. But it, it brings me to the, the next aspect of this event, which was the auction. And, mm. and the, the big misconceptions that we had about the, as I was referring to it, the financial enthusiasm for classic cars uh, mm-hmm. that everybody expected. So, you know, the, the stereotype oh is that the Saudis are all, you know, dripping in oil money and they've all got right. you know, unlimited resources. And uh, it turns out that that's not really the case. Um, not to say they don't have the resources, uh, but... Um, they are they're not foolish with their money they okay they, they don't spend willy-nilly and uh, interestingly part of this event was the um, the salon which was an entire building full of cars for sale and the cars all had uh, a descriptive sheet on the windshield with mm-hmm. details and then a price right and then you had the auction, which the cars did not have any prices on them. It was just up to the auctioneer to, to start the to bid. To drive it up, yeah. Get it going. Well, when the auction finally rolled around, not none of the car. I think three or four cars sold in the auction, and that's it. Oh, boy. Yeah, right. And there was hundreds Oof. of cars that went through the auction. So immediately everybody's panicking, you know, what's going on here? And, and um, unfortunately, a lot of the feedback from the states was very negative about the Saudis and, you know, just just making up stuff about what was going on. Uh, okay. But what we believe, um, having been there, is that uh, when the Saudis saw some of the prices on the salon cars, mm-hmm. They started to have a few questions, and and the the reason for it is because the the cars, 
if you were to send over a car from the States, which most of them came from here, uh, what you were told is that, okay, at this event, um, the, the, the kingdom is paying for the cars to get shipped over and, and be there, uh, but the kingdom is going to put a $30,000 premium on each car mm. as a way to try and recoup some of their investment and in putting this event on. Okay. Okay. So they wanted a, um, a high caliber of car, not only to demonstrate a high quality of level of cars, but they they wanted cars that the thirty thousand dollars really wouldn't affect you know that much. Okay. Right. So if you if you send a five hundred thousand dollar car, yeah, thirty grand really doesn't matter that much. Right. Exactly. Um, but not all the cars were in that range, and okay. in addition to that. The auction had a uh, premium, I think a 10% grease on, on the auction as well. Um, so now you're at, you know, potentially, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 of taxes and fees added to the price of the car. Huh. Not only that, but because <laughs> we had... There's more. Yeah, there, but wait, there's, there's a lot more. Um, because... Americans didn't understand the culture and we were told for years in the media and in you know movies and, and general stereotypes that right. these people are made of money mm-hmm. uh, so they were told to price the cars at whatever you want you know because they got it they'll buy them they'll buy yeah. it so uh, the salon cars one example was a, uh, a Gullwing Mercedes that, you know, my guess, the, the street value was probably a million and a half or so, and it was listed okay. for like three million bucks. Oh. And these guys were inspecting and checking the cars out, and they're like, why is that so expensive, you know? Okay. And they would pull their phone out, and they would look at eBay, and they would look at the Haggerty pricing tools, and they would look at mm-hmm. Meekum and Bear Jackson, and, and they're like, this car's right. way overpriced. They have all okay. those resources. My. And well, pretty soon they were starting to say that it looks like the Americans have come here to take advantage of us. Oh, ouch. Right, which wasn't good. So yeah. the way that they um, reacted to that was by not buying anything at the auction because they just automatically assumed that everything was way overpriced. And, and they were correct, you know. Oh um, boy! So they were making a statement that said, "You know, we're we're not." And and one guy came to our booth um, afterwards and was talking to Grady, uh, and he was saying that uh, you know some of you Americans think that you know we wipe our rear ends with hundred dollar bills. <laughs> and, well, don't you? <laughs> right, and that is uh, clearly not the case. Right. So that sent a ripple throughout the the industry because it wasn't immediately obvious as to why this auction was tanking um, mm. and, and speculation was flying, you know. And, and, and there was one other negative uh, aspect, and that is that some of the cars got damaged in shipping uh, oh, no. from the U.S. over there, right? Uh, Ring Brothers, for example, had a Mustang that got beat up badly. It was loose in the oh. container, and it smashed into another car, and, you know, a lot of bad stuff happened. And when they unpack the car, you know, the bumper falls off and it was it was bad. And the Saudis immediately got a bad rap. The event got a bad rap saying, you know, you guys don't know how to manage the cars or whatever. But again, a little research determined that it, it got narrowed down to essentially one shipper and, and one shift in the US huh. that failed to strap them down properly before they got okay. sent across the ocean. So <clears throat> it, it really had nothing to do with, with the Saudis. It was on right. American soil. Mm. But the perception, again, not understanding, um, cast a negative spin on everything right away, uh, which was a letdown because that, that's not really yeah. what happened. You know, and, uh, There was uh, one other example where... You might have seen the car. Uh, uh, Denny Terzic and, and Pro Rides a couple of years ago built a 55 Chevy called Xbox. And it's a uh, an LS um, turbo car. It's black with a blue 
insert stuff ski did the design work on it huh. every panel's been touched 3d print work i mean all kinds of crazy stuff cool and, and that car got sent over for the uh it was definitely in the salon possibly the auction and that car journeyed across the united states across the ocean i think it landed in in Jeddah in saudi arabia then it was trucked down to riyadh in a container and then it came out of the container and the minute it hit the ground um, it was very dusty from being in the container sure and somebody took a picture of it right away and posted it online saying you know these are these same people that that drive Ferraris and abandon them on the side of the road and and let them let them to be covered in dust and and don't take care of anything and it, it caused a big wave again of people becoming outraged at what they were seeing and uh-huh. the reality is I don't know half an hour after that picture was taken uh, that car was spotless because uh-huh. there was a team on site that was doing a steam clean process that was blowing them off steaming them off and then polishing them and and some some of the other Americans also volunteered to help buff and polish that car and make it look perfect again uh-huh. but that picture didn't get shared you know of it course was, not. It was only the one where it was covered in dust. Yeah. So. It sounds like somebody was trying to create their own narrative of, of things. Well, I, I just think it's because there is a misunderstanding. And, and, and I fully admit, a month ago, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, sure. You know, I'd never been there. And, and one of the things that's really easy to do, having been there, uh, is look at the differences as opposed to the similarities. And one example is the Arabic language, right? When you mm-hmm. write the Arabic language to us, it looks like a bunch of squiggles. All right. You cannot look at an Arabic phrase and make out what it says unless you've been trained in Arabic. Right. Their language, spoken language, sounds nothing like English. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Spanish. You can, if somebody says, you know, donde esta el automobile? Yeah. Oh, yeah, where's the car? You know, I can kind of uh, get donde that. Donde esta el biblioteca? Right. <laughs> yeah, where's the <laughs> library? <laughs> uh, but in Arabic, it does. there's no words to sound out that are even remotely close to anything in English. Right. It's just right. a totally different language. So there's mm-hmm. two differences. The next one is the clothing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Arab, you know, the, the, the Saudis, the women are... are you know, shown in the media wearing the the uh, hijab, which is the the black cover from head to yes. toe, with the little slit for the eyes, mm-hmm. uh, or a, or a an abaya, which is a headscarf. You know, mm-hmm. and and that looks very different to what we're used to, and it makes us nervous. You know, we don't know what it is. The only time you ever right. see that stuff is in a movie where something bad's about to happen, <laughs> right? I mean, for real, that's what you see. Yeah. And, and the men, many of them, wear what's called a tobe, which is a, a robe from head to toe, mm-hmm. and, and the headscarf, you know, with the ring around the top, and the, right. the red houndstooth plaid-looking, mm-hmm. you know, um, head cover. And nobody really knows what that's all about here. Is it a religious thing? Is it political? You know, why do they do this? We don't mm-hmm. know. Well, when we went over there, we learned that... Um, women are not forced to wear the cover-ups. They wear them by choice. Really? Yes. And the degree of that which you, you cover up um, is determined by several factors, right? So, so some of them uh, choose to cover up when they get married because they are, they are preserving themselves for their husband's eyes only, right? Okay. So there's one. Another one is that the, the Muslim religion um, really... Uh, uh, promotes the concept of humility and and right. being humble in the eyes of Allah, right? right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they cover up because the, the more covered you are, the less of an individual you are in public and the more humble you are before mm-hmm. their God, which is like the opposite of the entitled, I'm an individual, <laughs> selfie, uh, you know, uh, social construct that we have here where everybody's right. special and unique right so it's just yeah. 180 um, and, and, but we've learned that uh, 
some of the more pious women will will cover up as much as they they want because of mm-hmm. you know the religious beliefs. Um, and then there's kind of the medium ground where they wear the headscarf and their face is visible, but many, many, many had no covering whatsoever with regard to the scarves or anything else. They, they're dressed like an average American person, you know, maybe not quite as, uh, um, you know, revealing of clothing, you know, most of them had long sleeve shirts on right. and, and, you know, like a, a dress pants kind of thing. So it wasn't as as liberal of a dress as you have here, but sure. uh, there's nothing that's that's forcing them to, to wear that stuff, and and the men in their their robes, the tobe, they do that as fashion. That's just a style yeah. thing. Um, we learned that the guys in in the white ones um, that comes from working outside in the sunlight, and right. it's it's cooler because it's white. And it's mm-hmm. kind of loose. Granted, it, it goes up to the neck and it goes right. to you know long sleeve, but it, they're very comfortable and they're easy to wear. And the headscarf keeps them out of the sun. And the way they wear it, if they let it flow, it's kind of you know to keep the sunlight off them. If they start to get warm, they, they tuck it up over their ears, and and hmm. and form it a little bit differently. And if they're cold, they might wrap it around the front of their face. So it's utilitarian. You know, it's got function. Sure. And and once I learned that, uh, and once I learned that the, the women weren't there to be intimidating, they were just there because of their, their beliefs, you know, mm-hmm. uh, all of a sudden I was, I was very much at ease uh, with seeing these uh, different wardrobes because they were, they were kind of neat looking. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the guys were wearing different colors, so the white ones were, you know, how I was describing, but uh, if it was a gray robe or a, a, a brown or a dark blue um, that kind of signified maybe a little higher social status maybe oh. um, maybe they were an executive and they worked in an office um, and Grady and I were, were talking about how you know we thought it might be cool you know to, to try one of these things on you know just because they looked they looked neat you know after a while and uh, one of the gentlemen we met actually sat me down and he, he put the head dress on and and showed me how it's styled and everything, and and I said, is, "Am I being offensive to you by wearing this? You know, because uh-huh. I'm, I'm an American." And right. he said, "No, no, 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 no. We we we're happy that you're taking an interest in Saudi culture. Oh, good. And, and we're honored that you would you know be willing to try this on and and uh, you know share share in our brotherhood. So uh, well, again, good. all the th- all the stuff that I thought I knew was backwards." <laughs> Yeah, I'm learning quite a bit from uh, from what I used to used to know and believe about uh, about that culture. That's that's pretty interesting stuff. I'm I'm glad you asked him if it was if uh, when when you were trying on the on the headpiece if it was offensive or not. So that's that shows deference and uh, probably he respected that from you. So well, so yeah, cool. I I didn't want to be you know that guy. Um. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, look at me, everybody. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> And you know, so we tried to um, we tried to be good ambassadors for our country and and the U.S. Mm-hmm. and and not cause problems. So mm-hmm. we were always wearing long sleeves and dressing conservatively. And and while I was doing the stage work and interviews, I had a jacket on and, and the whole thing. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean a lot of our counterparts they were wearing the same stuff they would wear to the SEMA show. So, mm-hmm. you know, short sleeve shirts with logos all over them and baseball caps and, you know, just regular car show stuff. And everybody mm-hmm. was fine with that. You know, there was no Good. no judgment, no problem. <clears throat> so it was really an eye-opening experience. Uh, uh, I think, uh, like I said, they, they've got a long way to go to kind of build that, that infrastructure up and to uh, right. um generate the kind of business that they, they want to do but they definitely want to do it uh, so well that, that's cool I mean I, I certainly think they can do it uh, and it certainly seems that they're on their way to do it especially by putting on this this large of a, of a show of, a, of an event that is and I hope that with all of the uh, hiccups that occurred uh, with either miscommunication or uh, not understanding uh, either 
from us not understanding their culture or they're not understanding ours, I hope that those things are able to be ironed out for the next time that this happens. So things will kind of change a little bit and go much more smoothly and be even more successful than, than this one. I hope so. And, and I really hope it happens again. We're kind of waiting to hear um, mm-hmm. if they're going to do it again. There was a, um, an entirely an, another aspect of this event that was really, really special, and that is that the, the timing, right? Mm-hmm. So typically in the U.S., a car show starts at, you know, 8 in the morning, goes to 5 or, or whatever. You know, SEMA hours are, are 9 a.m. to 5. Right. Well, this one, it didn't start till like 2 in the afternoon. And we left at midnight every night, and there were still Oof. people there until 2 or 3 in the morning. And part My of goodness. the reason that, that we were told is that their culture shifts everything later uh, because it's so hot during the day in the summertime. Okay. Um, but I just think they're a, they're a nighttime-based society. You know, that, that, that's when they mm. do their recreational stuff is at night. So we would get there at 8.30 or 9 in the morning, and it gave us a chance to walk the show and see the cars and everything, and in our case, um, get the, the stage crew set up and, and the lights and all that stuff and cameras because we took all that down every night. Uh, and get things mm. going, um, but uh, uh, it was really wild to see you know these people start to trickle in at, at two and three and four, but in that morning day period, it gave us Americans that that came there a chance to bond more with each other. Mm, good. So we spent a lot of time with Chip Foos um, and uh, Carson Lev, uh, who. who does a lot of chips, uh, uh, you know, representation and, and uh, event planning and whatnot. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, Chip got bored and came over and was teaching Grady and Kelly how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That was neat. <laughs> and, and the Kindig guys were right across from us, and and uh, the guys from Classic Car Studio were right down the hallway from us, and mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know some of the other companies, the Ring Brothers. You know Mike Ring and his wife and kids all mm-hmm. came out, and we just had a lot of time to spend with them, which normally we only get passing in the hallway at, a, at an event somewhere else. You know just to say hi. So right. it was a nice, nice way for us to go eight thousand miles away and hang out. <laughs> you know with people that be able to have a conversation with somebody. <laughs> right. You know it, it seems silly, but that that's that's what happened. So that was that was all really cool too. Well, I hope you gave Chip my best. I'm sure he was I did. worried. He, he asked about your gangrenous hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you one thing. Uh, that, that my he, man. Yeah. One thing that he did was that was super cool is he had a, um, a, a couple um, sketching sessions on, on our stage where he taught some of the locals how to draw. And the locals oh, were nice. six or eight uh, female art teachers and 10 or 12 female art students that were, you know, anywhere from probably second or third or fourth grade level. Uh, there was one little boy, I think, in, in all mm-hmm. of the two sessions. All were women. And they're, they, you know, they were dressed in in the. Some had the hijab with just the eyes, uh, right. cut, you know, revealed, and some had headscarves. And mm-hmm. here's Chip Foose teaching him how to draw, you know, a thirty-two Ford. Wow! It was what an experience, man. Mind bending, you know. And yeah, we, we don't think that has ever happened before, you know. Yeah, I doubt it. Yeah. Right. And, and they just loved it, and and some of them you could tell they were kind of batting their eyes at old Chip too. I think they liked him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that was unexpected. Um, how neat that was. And then uh, mm. uh, Kelly, who was very concerned initially with her personal safety, and you know, she had heard stories about. Uh, some woman showed an ankle and got stoned in the street or, you know, some kind of whatever. And I'm not saying that stuff never happened in the past, but um, on this trip, 
didn't didn't have any anything even close to like that happening. And in fact, uh, Kelly hosted a roundtable discussion of women in motorsports on the stage with the lights and a PA system. And it was her, um, a woman named Deb Farrington, who is a uh, uh, a firefighter and paramedic by day and an autocross racer in the Optima series on the weekends. And Amazing. Then, and then she had uh, um, Kendra Summers, who who's a, uh, a an online video producer. Um, she had a woman named uh, Eva Castellane, who is the Middle East marketing rep for Motul Oil, the uh, um, racing and off-road oil company. And then she had uh, AJ from Overhauling on her panel. Mm -hmm. And then she had the NHRA top fuel drag racer, Erica Enders, uh, on her panel. Oh, wow. And they were all talking about what it's like to be a woman in motorsports, but they're all on stage in Saudi Arabia wearing American clothes. And, you know, it was, I think that was kind of unprecedented also. Talk about busting through a glass ceiling. That really shows it. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It was really, really wild. Um, so again, I'm still trying to figure out what even happened. You know, it, it, just to have so many mm. expectations and have them all change, and then to let in the fact that this event was was just awesome on so many levels. The cars mm-hmm. they had were were phenomenal. The uh, the exotics that that came out from other countries that were you know part of some of the other events there were unbelievable. Uh, yeah, the auction didn't go as planned, but uh, mm-hmm. the 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 people that we talked to that that clued us in on on why it didn't go well also said, yeah, but next year, you know, it won't be priced that way and it'll be different. We learned lessons, and that's that's all you can do. Right. You, you're you're never going to know how something is gonna p- turn out until you do it. Right. So you just had to do it to find out where. The, the pitfalls were, and then you can fill those in, and it'll be smooth the next time. So, yep, yep. I mean, as long as you learn from it, it's not a failure. It was just a hiccup, and it was a learning point. Uh, totally, totally. Yeah. And, and especially because the financial investment was absorbed by their country, you know? So it's mm. not like, you know, somebody was out 20 grand shipping a car back and forth. Right. And, and, and even though those cars didn't sell, I think the knowledge exchange that happened... The, the crowds that were drawn in because there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people that came to this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it generated the buzz about the industry that I think the, the, the kingdom wanted to do. And, and the crown prince came to visit uh, one day and was there. Oh, cool. um, I, I believe the, uh, the king himself was there. Uh, oh, boy. The, the brother of the... Um, uh, I, I was saying the word king, but I, apparently it's not right. But I guess the premier of, of um, Dubai, uh, he was okay. there. Uh, so a, a lot of royalty and, and heads of state from around the region came to see the event, which was really, really far out. Um, and I personally had, had some really wonderful opportunities to do some interviews uh, on the stage. So... Um, uh, I did a, a panel discussion with, with American car customizers. So it was uh, uh, Chip Foose, Dave Kindig, Jimmy Shine, uh, yeah. um, and then uh, Miles Kovacs. And M- Miles is the guy who started Dub Magazine. And, oh, right. And, and all of the brands that are associated with that. Miles is a great, great guy. All those guys are really, really tremendous. Mm-hmm. Especially uh, Chip. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Lefty, as you know, you call. It. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and then you know there was there was a lot of really notable people that came out. Uh, um, so I I had time on stage with Tony Schumacher, the top fuel drag racer, and uh, Tony and I went to the same high school, but didn't know each other until many years later. No uh, kidding. Yeah. Um, huh. And then uh, I had time with Cruz Pedregon, you know, another uh, NHRA mm-hmm. top fueler. And then uh, guys like Iron Man Ivan Stewart, you know, legendary off-road racer. The Iron Man, that, when I saw that picture, that really, that was, ooh, that was so cool. Yeah. Who doesn't love the Iron Man? He's awesome. He is awesome. And it, it, it was a great conversation. And, and we, we talked all about, you know, what it takes to be a champion. And, and he is in every sense of the word, you know, in, in, in yeah. sport and in life. And there's just so much to learn from that guy. 
uh, and then you know chatted with a bunch of manufacturers and and other media mm-hmm. people and 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 again more notables a lot of artists were out there so had, our buddy Ed Tilrock was yeah, out Tilrock, there and, yeah. Uh, Max Grundy and Alex Carmona and uh, uh, you know it, it was kind of a bummer that we had to go to the other side of the world to to hang out like that <laughs> um, but it was great but, but but look at it this way you got to go to the other side of the world and hang out together we did yeah yeah, yeah we did and and the food was wonderful the whole time and mm-hmm. and uh, they built this whole structure in a matter of months um, and, and pulled it off. So to to the Bonnie Air crowd and and uh, Peter McGillivray and Jonathan Moore who who you know run that division, mm-hmm. uh, I still can't believe that it even happened. The amount of sheer labor it took to do all this uh, was mind bending. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and SEMA had sent a representative out there. Uh, uh, she is a a business development. Uh, uh, international business development person for SEMA to help connect people uh, to businesses and, and and personally I think SEMA should have had a little bit more of a presence uh, uh-huh. because these companies uh, in the Middle East <clears throat> need SEMA's services to grow um, and, and right. uh, expand the market share so we'll see if they get more involved in the future cool um, but uh, yeah it was it was the real deal man it was something else yeah, man. I tell you, I remember when you and I were talking when you first heard that the that Peter wanted you to be involved in this, and you were telling me all about it. And I'm like, I know how massive it's going to be. I just could not wrap my mind around all the logistics and how that was going to get pulled off. But it, it got pulled off. Yep. And there's some pretty smart smart people working that show to to do it. So you know, hats off to them, man. Yeah, and they're still there. Um, they oh, boy. Will, yeah, they, they anticipated being there for a month solid after the event in Teardown. And, okay. And uh, they're making sure that... Uh, so all those cars are coming back to the States, and they're right. make, making sure that they're all strapped down properly. And mm-hmm. Joe Sebergandio, uh, you know, my old buddy who I do a lot of the work with at the SEMA show, Mm-hmm. He was an operations guy over there, so he's he's leading a team that is strapping cars down and and handling oh, all that. Oh, perfect! Yeah, so you, you'll know it's getting done right. Um, Good, because they got the right people on it. Um, but yeah, nice, it was it was really an amazing experience. I I hope you get to do it again. I hope it it goes on again, and I and I'm I I'm sure you'll get tapped to do it again if it. Well, we'll see. I mean, but um, I was talking with Jonathan Moore from Bonnie Air, and I said, you know what's crazy is a year ago, nobody in attendance that came from the U.S. was thinking that, you know where we need to be next year? You know <laughs> you know what I think the next hot market is for my suspension parts? I think we need to be in Saudi Arabia. Saudi you know, Arabia. Nobody thought that. Uh, yeah. and, and largely because, you know, nobody knew what was going on over there and the opportunity mm-hmm. didn't exist. Um, so, but I learned that, uh, Saudi is the fifth largest market for American cars in the world. Really? Yeah. So, Jeez. so that was, and we learned that at the embassy. So the, the U S embassy hosted a dinner, um, and, and gave a speech about, uh, the economics of the region when it comes mm-hmm. to the automotive sector and and what's popular and what's not and what they do to try and help facilitate all that so so that was really cool um and then our trip to the air base was interesting uh it was a uh, a u.s air force base that um its sole function today is to train the saudis who are purchasing their own aircraft Mm -hmm. and and teaching them how to uh, maintain them, how to fly mm-hmm. them, um, but also to train them so that they know what they're buying. Because in many ways, oh, okay. they put an order in for you know X number of aircraft, and they need an expert to certify that that's truly what they got. Oh, okay. Right? Because um, they're not All familiar right. with it. And and then to provide an advisory role of of you know, training their people on how to do the basic maintenance and do repairs on stuff. And mm-hmm. apparently, as soon as the uh, U.S. Air Force is confident enough with the Saudi Air Force um, in maintaining these aircraft, 
we're going to turn that base over to them, and then they're going to oh, they're going to run it on right? their own. Um, How long has that base been uh, in in operation? It's been there a while. Um, I is don't it? know a whole lot of the specifics uh, about it, um, but what I did learn is that uh, uh, when you hear a lot of these foreign aid numbers, we hear a lot of mm-hmm. money that gets spent in different countries from the U.S. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the media doesn't do a really good job of telling you what that aid is buying. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people think it's just, you know, we're dropping food on doorsteps or, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're spending money in countries. Um, but in this case, you know, Saudi Arabia has oil reserves and has a lot of money. So why is the U.S. sending money there, right? And, mm-hmm. and really what we're doing is providing education and training for them mm-hmm. to be more self-sufficient uh, with their technology, and that's where a lot of the that foreign aid costs goes. costs money. Okay. It costs money, exactly. Yeah, so, makes sense. Yeah. Makes total sense. And, and I learned something there at the base. Um, it was funny because <laughs> uh, we were uh, you know, kind of presented as, as almost being celebrities because some of mm. some of the people in our on our group were so like aj from overhaul and chip Foose, right. you know they, everybody knows them and they're like yeah so aj and chip Foose are to be here and some other automotive uh, celebrities from the states well a lot of the airmen and there was army uh, soldiers there as well they had no clue who we were you know they <laughs> they, they don't follow that stuff you know they, they might not right. be gearheads or whatever but mm-hmm. what they were is very happy to have visitors uh, because oh, good. a lot of times they don't have other American civilians that come and hang out with them. Sure. So they were uh, uh, really great to talk to, and, and we learned a lot. Uh, one gentleman uh, was training Kelly about how the inner workings of the, the jet engines work on Black Hawk helicopters, uh, complete with cool. cutaway diagrams and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Oh, man, I bet she was into it. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She... she has repeatedly said she missed the boat on on her educational path because you know if she had the opportunity to learn how to fix helicopters she she would have taken it. <laughs> mm. um, right on. Yeah, um, but also uh, we learned and and you know this being a veteran that uh, it was spelled out for me anyway a little more clearly that a lot of our soldiers have a career path um, in the service that is largely a meritocracy. Um, you know, if you're good at something, um, you might get advanced in rank to do more of mm-hmm. it or to run, you know, things, uh, as opposed to being in the private sector where a lot of times you have to sell yourself and, mm-hmm. and identify opportunities and, and train up for them and, and you know, uh, uh, present your skill set and, and really pursue those. Mm-hmm. So um, we were talking with a couple airmen who uh, will be getting out of the Air Force in, in the next you know, near foreseeable future, and they felt they didn't have the skill set to sell themselves to an employer. Mm. Cause I, I hear that's a problem with uh, people getting out of the military, is that the, their skill set doesn't necessarily translate into anything worthwhile in, in the civilian sector, and that's a real problem. Well, these particular gentlemen, their skill set is invaluable, I think, in the, in the the private sector. It's just getting them to approach an employer and present and sell that skill set. Because mm. in many ways, you know, this one gentleman was telling us, so, so he oversees, uh, he was a maintenance advisor, and it's his job to keep 28 airplanes in the air, and oversee the crews that keep 28 airplanes in the air. So he had 300 people working under him. And wow. everything was, you know, procedure, policy, you know, strict management structure. I mean, this mm. is what companies need, right? You know, right. private companies. But everything that, that he does is um, essentially an assignment straight out of a policy manual, um, or he is told what's expected of him, and then he has to go make that happen. And it's, it's not going up to company X and analyzing what that company needs and saying, well, here's what I can do for you. He's mm-hmm. more used to being kind of told right. what needs to be done from him. So we are now trying to figure out ways to help these uh, ladies and gentlemen out with uh, that skill set of uh, 
being confident that the things that they've learned do translate and mm-hmm. and presenting that information to a potential employer through an interview or or you know uh, casual conversation in a manner that uh, uh, pitches their services and helps them to uh, you know I, we just told them straight up if you're when you get out and you go to apply for a job what what as as a company that hires people like we do it's very important for somebody to come to us and say well here's your problem and here's what I can do to solve it. You know, mm-hmm. bring that solution um, right. as opposed to just saying, well, what are your hours and how much am I going to make? You know, <laughs> 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 and, and, and both these guys were like, oh, yeah, right. Well, you know, the, the lights were starting to come on. Uh, mm-hmm. and it's a bummer that they don't have that kind of uh, job acquisition, career acquisition skill training. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it is. It so is. That, that all grew out of our visit to the airbase. Well, that's cool, man. I hope... Uh... Are you going to try to develop something to give back to those guys, or how, yeah? How do you, what, what's we your also uh, met one of the PR officers there, who I've been corresponding with um, about helping these people with this very topic. And you know, I don't know if you know the way that I can help is purely through my own experiences, just like what I told mm-hmm. you. You know, when we interview somebody. Yep. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of online video resources available that we might be able to pull together a bunch of stuff and say, here, just check these out, you know, as you, as you start to transition into civilian life. I got um, you. We exchange numbers and, and email addresses, and, and we extended all these guys, even though they have nothing to do with the automotive world, uh, but we personally invited them to contact us if they want to do a mock interview or if they want to just chat about this stuff. Um, right on, man. You know, we're more than happy to help because, uh, uh, you know, we definitely feel a debt of gratitude to our, our people in the military who've been looking out for us and doing jobs like they've been doing, you know, in different sure. countries and whatnot. Um, and it's it's a small scale thing, you know. I, I don't have the resources to launch a, a global program. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know if we can produce a few videos that get shared and, and maybe help mm-hmm. them out you know that that's something that we're going to try and do that's that's you know what a lot of these guys who get out of the military you you hit the nail on the head they've come from an environment where they are told what to do and what's ex- to to the letter of what's expected out of them and to make that transition to being a self-starter and taking initiative and seeing problems and solving them is difficult for a lot of people. It was, it was hard for me. Oh, when, I, when I got out of the Air Force, it, I had a hard time finding a job. I had a really hard time. Thank God uh, a friend of my uncle's worked at a place where he, he got me a job doing doing some, you know, menial stuff, but, you know, not a career by any stretch, but it was a job. You know, I was living at home again after four years of, of being in the military. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do, man? I mean, I don't want to yeah. work at McDonald's for crying out loud. Right. So I, I need something that's going to, you know, appeal to my, you know, electromechanical skill set that I, that I possess. And luckily I found that, but it was... It was really difficult. So mm-hmm. to, to, to be able to help these guys is it, it's a it's a bigger deal than, than you realize f- for these guys. It's huge. Well, so I it's... just I feel like they're shortchanged, um, mm-hmm. and not it's not by design. You know, I think the military is there right. to to train people to do tasks and and mm-hmm. and then they move on. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think the military is really super you know concerned with uh, providing a career beyond the military true you know, they're, they're there for for what they're there for mm-hmm. um so it, it it's our responsibility in the in the civilian world to help these people because they have so much to offer you know the again the, the management skills that this one gentleman was talking about <clears throat> and and another guy was a um um and uh, an ammunitions um advisor so mm-hmm. so he was training uh, in this case, the Saudis on um, how to uh, mount munitions to, to, to aircraft and take them down and service them and load them and identify them and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's mm-hmm. that's mechanics, you know. That that right. skill set translates instantly if you mm-hmm. present it the right way. Uh, exactly. 
and that's a problem. They, these these young airmen getting out, they they don't know how to present that, right? And employers don't necessarily know how to recognize that. So right. it's it's a, it's like two ships passing in the night right. that have a lot that can really benefit each other, but they don't know each other is there. Really. Totally, so, totally. And and in our case, we have um, you know Sergeant Jason Beebe, who was in the Air Force, mm-hmm. who works for us at our shop, right. and he was right in that same boat too. I mean, he he mm-hmm. was an Air Force loadmaster and and flying crews and equipment all around the world, and he got out mm-hmm. and found himself working a parts counter at an auto parts store. Uh, just mm-hmm. because nobody asked the right questions of what he had to offer, and right. and he didn't have the uh, the <clears throat> skill set and quite frankly the personality to he's not going to stand in a soapbox and say he's great, right. you know, right? You know, he's very humble and and take just, me, I'm valuable, right? Yeah, you know, he, he he and we met him at a job fair at at Scott Air Force Base, and ended up uh, uh, Kelly recognized that. Um, a he was he was like hyper respectful you know just yes sir no sir mm-hmm. you know by the book and and uh, we hired him in as a shop assistant and now he basically runs you know the operations of our whole organization you know he handles shipping in and out everything you know mm-hmm. is, is where things are organized and placed and processes and, yeah. and all this stuff uh, and and for him it's it's second nature because that's what he did for twenty years. Sure. We have everything but the airplane, basically, you know, <laughs> what, from, <laughs> from what he did. And, and we really, nice. you know, it, we, we find ourselves asking, well, how are, how are these people not being snapped up immediately after mm-hmm. their service uh, and, and being placed in positions? Because they've got so many skills that are just missing from general society. Yeah. Uh, so I think it really, that connection is fractured between as soon as they get out and, and, and getting a career start. So I think it's in the best interest of our country to help these people out. Um, let Couldn't alone agree more. Our self-serving interest of, you know, maybe we find another gem to hire on our team. You know, who knows? Mm-hmm. But, right on, man. Yeah. So again, right. that, that's, that, so now you know why my head is spinning right now because. Um, yeah. You, <laughs> you got a lot going on up there, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it was only a couple weeks after the SEMA show and, and, uh, and then our next episode, we're going to hear your story of the uh, muscle yes. car and Corvette nationals and, and how our team had a big win with the car and, mm-hmm. and you were able to pull off uh, all of your tasks there. So that's a nice little teaser. Stay tuned. That's right. So the, the month of November was just enormous in every way possible. So it's, it's no wonder why I'm a little bit run down and, and, mm. and fighting a cold because I got a lot to process. <laughs> Amen, man. No doubt. No doubt. All right. All well, right. we've teased them long enough. Let's All right. get into our Let's trivia get, questions. Our trivia. All right. So, Kevin, I asked you, what was the most powerful factory stock engine that GM has produced? And uh, you said the current uh, LT5, uh, pumping out about 730 horsepower. Um, you you actually corrected my own trivia question because I had uh, uh, the LT4 at 650, but not totally not thinking about crate engines. But you're absolutely right. So LT5 is it? Wow. I, yeah. I was expecting you to tell me it was like in the in the Terex Titan earth moving equipment. No, something that no, made, you know, ten thousand foot I should pounds. Have, <laughs> I, I should have worded the question better and said, uh, you know, engine that was available in a factory production car. Um, but I just it just escape me to say that but no lt5 is is more than correct so congratulations kevin hey all right hey that one I so got you could be all run down and still get the question <laughs> right well i got lucky okay well in my case i asked you in 1973 and this probably does apply throughout all the 70s and probably into mm-hmm. the 80s um what did 80 percent of all motorhomes have in common and you said uh, <laughs> rear wheel drive, which <laughs> I, I'm gonna say was is is probably right. You uh-huh. know, I, I would think that it was probably more than eighty percent because I, I don't I don't know how many of the GMC front drive motorhomes they made. I don't I, don't. I can't see it being more than five percent of the market. But yeah. uh, the the answer. So you win. That was right. 
Uh, yeah, but yeah, we the, don't know that, but the answer I was going for was uh, 80% of them had a Dodge chassis. Get out of here, really? Yeah, Dodge owned I... the RV market. So Winnebago and and the Dodge and and Viking and all of those brands of motorhomes, 80% no of them were built kidding. on a Dodge chassis. Well, I'll be darned. That is interesting, except for the few that were built on the GM chassis. That's it. (laughs) That's it. And now you know why they wanted to do that revolutionary front drive chassis, because they wanted a little piece of that action. Yeah, I guess so. And I love that that motorhome. I love that front drive motorhome. Oh, yeah. They're cool. Yeah. Those are cool. Yeah. All right, Mm. my man. Well, that uh, that was quite a show. Yeah, it was. Great show. Great recap of, of the uh, Global Auto Salon in Riyadh. I loved learning about your adventures out there and, and how it opened your eyes to hope what the culture is really shifting to, which is really positive. Uh, and and I, I want to hear definitely more about that, and I, wanna, I can't wait to read more stories about it and, and see more, uh, more uh, videos being put out about that from other people as well as you. And... Uh, it, I, I really think this is the start of something really huge that's going to happen in that region. So, and 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 yeah. you were there for the ground in the ground floor. Well, and for the first time, I really feel like we can be part of something um, because it, those changes. And and I'm not just saying in Saudi; it could be anywhere, uh, but they're not going to happen on their own. And, and right. Uh, so we've been communicating with people over there to help them with their own events help them contact more U.S. companies. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess the, the, the takeaway from, from that whole experience is that uh, uh, I've reached a point in, in my world where I, I finally feel like I've got maybe something to offer, you know, for, for those, well, sure. those people there and, and maybe our, our servicemen and, and whatever. You know, it's, it's, time to, it's time to give something back, and um, that's what we're going to try and do, so. Amen, brother. Yeah, right on. All right, so you heard the preview. Tune in next time when we hear Mike say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you'll be able to hear that on the next episode of V8 Radio found on TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Chaser. and V8Radio.com. That's right. And Facebook. And Facebook. Yes. And uh, until then, I guess uh, keep the shiny side up. I'm Kevin Osti for Mr. Mike Q-Ball Clark, and uh, we will talk at you next time on V8 Radio. <laughs>